A wise man, a prudent man, looks far down the road, Proverbs says, and he sees things in the future that he considers he may need to avoid. He sets himself up to succeed. That's the wisdom that Joseph had. Tonight we're talking about the life of Joseph, the life of Joseph, wise and discerning, wise and discerning. You know, we've been studying the life of Joseph and uh, several of us have been reading through from Genesis 30 all the way through the end of Genesis, picking out some things in Joseph's life that we could apply to our lives. And that's the very, that's the, the reason why God has written this word. And that's the reason why he wrote real things about real people. It's so that we could look at their real life and we can glean from them things to apply to our life. And tonight we're going to continue in chapter 41, Genesis chapter 41, with the life of Joseph. You know, this, this takes place sometime after Joseph was already imprisoned and, and uh, you know, after he had already encountered those two officers of Pharaoh. You remember if you were here Sunday, we talked about that. And, and uh, you know, these, uh, these two officers, uh, the, the butler and the baker, had offended Pharaoh. We don't know what they did, but Pharaoh got mad and he put him in prison. He put him in this dungeon uh, along with Joseph. And after a season of time, you may remember that they had a dream, each one of them, and Joseph interpreted the dream. And the, the, the interpretations led to one of them being released from prison and restored as the butler, and while the other one was hanged on a tree. Well, it was, uh, you know, uh, 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 a, a sad um, uh, end to this interpretation of the dreams, but true nonetheless. The only thing that Joseph asked in all of this that we studied on Sunday, the only thing he asked was that he asked the butler, whenever you are restored to your rightful position, remember me. And I hope that you this week have been remembering those who have made an impact in your life and that you have somehow have reached out to them and encouraged them and thanked them as we talked Sunday. Many of us made commitments on Sunday that this week we were going to take time to find someone that had made a positive impact in our life and we were going to thank them and remember them. Joseph just wanted to be remembered, but when the butler was released uh, and restored, he forgot all about Joseph. And that's where we pick up on this account of the life of Joseph. Tonight we're talking about being wise and discerning as Joseph was. Genesis 41, verse number 1. We'll read a few, few verses all through this chapter and uh, we'll catch up on the story, okay? Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. And behold, he stood by a river. Now, Two years. Joseph had been forgotten for two years. Can you imagine that? My goodness. Who, who wants to stay in prison two years longer than they feel like they had an opportunity to get out? He, he interpreted the dream of the butler. The butler was restored and he forgot about Joseph. Two full years later, Pharaoh has a dream. Now, the dream that Pharaoh had, you can read it, but let's just cover it for the sake of time, was, was a dream that there were seven fat cows that came up out of a river. And they were fat and flourishing and healthy, and they just looked really good. But there were also seven very skinny and lean cows that came up out of that river. And in Pharaoh's dream, he watched those lean and weak, emaciated cows consume the healthy cows, the fat cows. He woke up and he was troubled. And, you know, uh, uh, he didn't know what to think about it. Then he went back to sleep and had a second dream. And the second dream, Pharaoh saw a, like a corn stalk 
come out of the ground and grow up and branch out. And he saw that there were seven full ears, fat, full, fruitful ears of corn on this stalk. Oh, they looked like they couldn't have done any better. And then he also saw seven lean, seven very thin, and seven very weak ears of corn. And the weak ears consumed those fat ears. It troubled him. He did not know what to think. And verse 8 says, Now it came to pass in the morning that Pharaoh's spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams. But there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh. He said this. I remember. (laughs) You know, remember he had forgotten? Now he remembers. I remember my fault this day. My goodness, it's just like I'm just waking up. I, I remember, you know, the dream that you've had and no one able to interpret it. Now, and, 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 you're, and you're troubled, Pharaoh. Now I remember. What did he remember? He remembered Joseph had interpreted his dream. And so he tells Pharaoh, Pharaoh, do you remember whenever you got angry with me and, and the other guy and you put us into prison? Well, while we were there... We each had a dream and we were very troubled and we didn't know what to think of it. And there was a man there. His name is Joseph. And Joseph, this man knows God. He came and interpreted our dream and it happened just exactly like he said. Wow, this guy can do it. So Pharaoh sins and and gets Joseph and you know, uh, uh, calls for Joseph to come and Joseph gets all cleaned up and, and is presented to Pharaoh and Pharaoh tells Joseph the dreams and, and, uh, um, you know, Pharaoh didn't know what to think of it, but Joseph said, let me tell you what your dream is. All interpretation belongs to God. God's going to give you a good answer. He said, God has specifically given you these two dreams, which are really one dream. And the reason he's given you these two dreams is because it's going to come to pass very shortly. The seven cows are seven years. The fat ones indicate seven years of bountiful harvest and and, and extra and abundance. And and the lean uh, cows represent seven years of famine and lack. And they will consume all that, you know has gone before. It won't be remembered. The good years won't be remembered because the bad years will be so bad. He said, and it's the same thing about the corn. The seven represents seven years. You know, you're going to have abundance and then there'll be seven years of famine and lack and you'll, it'll, it'll, it'll just waste away. He said, now Pharaoh, let me tell you what to do. Okay. Verse 25. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown you, Pharaoh, what he is about to do. Verse 33. Now, therefore, Pharaoh, select a discerning and a wise man. Thus, the title of our message tonight, Joseph. You know, this wise and discerning man. Select a discerning and a wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. He tells him in verse 36, Then that food which is gathered, that one-fifth of the produce of those good years, Then that food shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. Then Pharaoh, verse 39, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning, And as wise as you. You shall be over my house. And 
All my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne, I will be greater than you. Verse 46 says that Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. And, and, as, and as he went through all the land of Egypt, those seven years of plentifulness, they began to gather a fifth of all the harvest. And they built granaries and they built storehouses and, and they continued to store in, in, in this abundance all over the land of Egypt so that um, basically, you know, they, they, they were gathering this one-fifth of all the harvest. Well, during those seven years, Joseph also married. Pharaoh gave him a wife. And Joseph had a couple of children. Verse 51 says, Joseph called the name of his firstborn Manasseh. For God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. That's what Manasseh means. God has made me forget all of my toil, all of my hardship. God has made me forget what it took to get here. And even all of my father's house. I now have family here. And not just family there. Verse 52, in the name of the second, he called Ephraim. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. <laughs> wow. Verse 53, then the seven years of plenty, which were in the land of Egypt, ended. Then began the years of famine. And the famine was great throughout all the world. Verse 56 says, the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. And the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. So all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because famine was severe in all the lands. Well, you know, we've covered this chapter kind of quickly, but I've given you a real synopsis of what the account is. What is it in Joseph's life? What does Joseph's life teach us? How can we also be both wise and discerning? How can we also take what God has for us and, and live life in the same manner that Joseph did? How can Joseph's life impact us? He was wise and discerning. How can we be wise and discerning? Wise in the sense that Joseph was wise. What was Joseph's wisdom? Well, he looked farther down the road than right where he was. The wisdom of Joseph meant that we need to look farther down the road and contemplate the consequences of our actions. What will happen if we do this? What will happen if we don't? What will happen to our future if we do this? What will happen if we don't? That's the wisdom that Joseph had. A wise man, a prudent man, looks far down the road, Proverbs says, and he sees things in the future that he considers he may need to avoid. He sets himself up to succeed. That's the wisdom that Joseph had. Joseph was also discerning. He was discerning in the sense that he chose to do right now what he knew would best serve his future. That's the discernment I want. I want the wisdom to look farther down the road and contemplate the consequences of my actions. If, if I make a decision to do something now, I, I want to look down the road and contemplate the consequences of doing this or not doing this. I want to be wise. I want to be able to forecast uh, my future. And also I want to be discerning as you do. Discerning in the sense that we choose to do now. Not just knowing, but choosing to do right now what will best serve our future. Okay? The prophet Jeremiah reveals the heart of God towards each one of us. You know the scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, for I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. You know, even God 
is interested in our future. You know? Seeing that God is so interested in our future, should not we be also wise and discerning? Wise enough to contemplate the consequences of our actions and discerning enough to make the right choice now to give us the best future. Well, the three things that Genesis 41 teaches us, and it teaches us to be wise and discerning. Joseph's life in Genesis 41 teaches me, and it will teach us all to be wise and discerning, to look down the road, contemplate consequences, and make the right choice today for the benefit of our future. Three things Genesis 41 teaches us that wise and discerning people do. Number one, wise and discerning people release the past. Wise and discerning people release the past. And that's what Joseph had to do if he was ever going to get into his future. You know, that's why he named his son Manasseh. Because he realized he had to release the past. He realized that God had brought him to a place where if he chose, he could be able to replace and forget the hardship, the road that brought him there. He could find a place where he was no longer focused on the pains of his past. If we're going to be wise and discerning, if we're going to look down the road, contemplate the consequences of our life, and make the right choices today that will affect our future in a positive way, the way that God wants us to be wise and discerning, we must come to a place where we refuse to focus on the pains of the past, where we refuse to, to continue to dwell on how hard it was to get here, how hard it is to stay here. We must release the past. Manasseh. God didn't give us this account and include these scriptures for any other reason other than he wanted us to draw a conclusion from them. That in order for Joseph to get into his future, he had to release his past. The pains of his past. The toil of his past. You see, wise and discerning people do not allow their past to become a roadblock to their future. Good or bad. Wise and discerning people. And that's what we all want to be and that's what God wants us to be. They do not allow the toil of their past. How hard they may have worked for something. Or how hard it may have been. Or what they may have had to give up. They do not allow their past to become a roadblock to their future. The second thing that we learn from Joseph and how to live a life that is both wise and discerning. What do wise and discerning people do? Wise and discerning people increase in affliction. Not that their afflictions increase. They increase during the times of affliction. Uh, look back to the, that huge stock market crash in 1929 and you'll see how many millionaires were made. Why? Because wise and discerning people, they increase during difficult times. They increase during affliction. You see, principles of increase work wherever you are and whenever you are. That's something that we often don't believe. That's something we often don't embrace. That's something that, 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 that somehow escapes us. That wise and discerning people and principles of increase, they work wherever you are and whenever you are. The same principles work. Have you ever noticed the vegetable gardens that are outside of the prisons? Have you ever noticed that? Prisoners out there working in the vegetable garden. Do you know that neither the seed nor the ground has any right to say that I'm not going to produce, I'm not going to yield my strength because the person that planted me is a crook? The seed doesn't care who plants it. 
It has no judgment. It has no criticism. It has no right of complaint. It will yield for anyone, rich or poor, or, or whether they're prisoners or not, or whatever they have or have not done, the earth will yield because principles of increase work. Wherever you are, whoever you are, whenever you are. And this is something that we often don't understand. Because sometimes when we may feel bad about ourselves, or we feel we're going through a bad time or we feel like the world is going through a bad time, if we're not watchful, we'll draw back. If we're not watchful, we will, we will choose not to increase. Do you know why there are so many hurting people economically? Because when people begin to hurt economically, they cease to sow. And when you cease to sow, guess what? You cease to reap. And the whole world follows that emotional roller coaster of how they feel about the moment whenever in reality God has designed increase even in affliction. The earth does not care who plants or waters or cultivates. Principles of increase work because they're worked. God watches over the harvest. He watches over the harvest of the righteous. Do you remember even in, 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 in Genesis chapter 26 verse 12, you can read it. Isaac sowed in the land of famine and he increased in the same year 100 fold. You see, we can increase in affliction. And that's what, you know, Joseph shows us. He named his second son Manasseh saying, God has increased me even in the midst of my affliction. God has watched over me. I have done what is right. I have applied the principles of righteousness, the principles of increase. I have sowed. I have presented myself well. I have done everything that you should do. And God used it to promote me. God used it to end. I, in, I, I was a prisoner. I was a slave. I, I had no chance. But the principles of increase work whenever you are, wherever you are, whoever you are. Harvest belongs to those who sow. You can read about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 6. God has designed that those who sow be partaker of what they sow. Be partaker, first partaker of the harvest. You know, principles of increased work. Don't believe and, and don't allow the economy to decide whether or not you're going to work the principles of God of sowing and reaping. Okay? Principles of increased work, even in affliction. You see, wise and discerning people keep sowing. They keep sowing. <laughs> they keep sowing. You know, business efforts, don't slack. Don't draw back. Don't get afraid and pull your feet up in business. If you're not watchful, you know, you'll send a ripple around the world. Everybody's doing it. But do you know when everybody's doing it? Oh, it's a good time to be different. It's a good time to grow in the midst of affliction. Increase. Don't let the devil tell you you can't increase just because everybody else around you is not. God watches over the harvest of the righteous. God watches over the seeds we sow. God watches over our businesses. God watches over our, our, our jobs. God watches over these things. Do it right. Do what, you know, uh, when, when the tough, you know, or, or, or when, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going, right? I promise you, if you'll do something, if you'll sit down if you'll just sit down with God just for a few minutes and pray and then begin to write down what God wants to say to you, begin to write down out of your spirit what you believe God would say if he was standing in your shoes, if you would just begin to write out of your heart and out of your spirit, you'll find out that God believes in you. You'll find out that God wants you to go forward, that the quickest way out of a hole is forward. Uh, you know, come on. You know, God's looking for you know, aggressive, decisive, and determined individuals to lead the defining battles of life, and we are in a battle. We need aggressive, decisive, determined, God-led, righteous people who will stand up and move forward. 
That's what brings individuals, families, communities, nations in the world out of the economic slumps. And believe me, it will cycle. That's, that's for certain. Okay? That's for certain. Wise and discerning people keep sowing. A third thing, you know, the first thing, wise and discerning people, you know, what, what do they do? They release the past. What do they do? They, they uh, increase in affliction. Wise and discerning people, you know, I mean, what greater affliction was there than in the land of Egypt? Wise and discerning people. Number three, they save for the future. Save for the future. Genesis 41 gives us a great formula. Genesis 41 says that God spoke through Joseph. Pharaoh recognized how wise and discerning he was. God, you know, Joseph even said, Pharaoh, find someone who is discerning and wise and get them to do this. This is a voice from heaven saying this. Take one-fifth of your increase. Take one-fifth of your income. Take one-fifth of your harvest. What's one-fifth? It's 20%. Take 20% and save it. Save it for your future. <laughs> Stop living on everything you make. Be wise and discerning. This is the will of God for every person. God wants us to save something for our future. And the biblical pattern here, if there's no other pattern in all the word of God, the biblical pattern is for us to make sure that we are putting something back for lean years. You want to know why? Because God knows that life cycles and this world cycles on an emotional roller coaster. There are good years and bad years and good seasons and bad seasons. There are seasons of, 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 of abundance and seasons of lack in every person's life, in every community in every economy, in every nation, it works. One-fifth was gathered during the good years. <laughs> oh, wow. That's 20%. This coincides with something I, I taught about a year ago. You may remember, we talked about looking at our income as though it were 10 apples. Do you all remember those ten, that, that, that 10 apple model? Okay. I would not be a good pastor if I didn't teach you how to be wise and discerning. To look farther down the road and to contemplate the consequences of your actions. I wouldn't be a good pastor if I didn't teach you to be discerning. To realize that the choice you make today, you need to realize it will affect your future. I wouldn't be a good pastor if I didn't encourage you to release the past. That's what God wants you to do. He wants you to not allow your past to become a roadblock for your future. It may have been hard. It may have been difficult. It may have cost you a lot. But come on now. God gives opportunity in new seasons of life. He gives opportunity for us to release the past. God gives opportunity even in the midst of difficult times, for us to increase. We are his children. He watches over the harvest of the righteous. Don't follow the world into, you know, Stingyville. Okay? And number three, save for your future. You remember, treat your income. I taught this about, must have been a year ago. Treat your income like it's ten apples. Let's say that you make, uh, for just for the sake of uh, uh, easy numbers, let's say you make $100 a week, okay? Ten apples, okay? What do you do with those ten apples? Here's the formula. You give to, you save to, and you learn to live on six. Don't you wish you started that 25 years ago? 
I promise you there's someone in your community that makes 60% of what you make and they live as good as you do. And there's somebody that makes twice as much as you make in your community and they don't live any better than you do. They don't have any more money than you do. Manage. God wants us to manage what he gives us. Tithes are important. You know, if you're not a tither, let me tell you, you're robbing yourself. You're robbing God. You are, you're, you're, you're not, you know, you're not allowing God into your, in, into your finances in a way that he wants to bless. He wants to be involved. Okay. But it's not just about tithes. It's about offerings. You know, give two of those apples. Save two of those apples. 20%, one fifth. And I say, how in the world do I get there? Well, you'll never get there if you don't begin. You'll never get there if you don't make a decision that you need to save for your future. Tonight, we're not talking about tithes and offerings. We're talking about saving for the future. Okay? You might say, how can I do it? Well, okay. Let me give you a few simple things. You're smart. This is not rocket science. Okay? Most likely... Most likely someone, at least one person in here, or perhaps somebody that's listening to us somewhere in Maryland, maybe, I don't know. Somebody, under the sound of my voice, is overextended financially. Someone that's listening to me is spending everything they make. Life is designed by God to be lived with a margin. What is a margin? A margin means that when you get to the top of the stairs, you still have some breath left. That when you get to the end of the day, you have some energy left. That when you get to the end of the week or the end of the month, you have some money left. Life is designed by God and best lived with a margin. And you are the only person that can create that margin financially in your life. And God wants you. God speaks to us about money in his word. His word teaches us that we should save something, that we should create a margin. Okay? And unless you have a better plan, chapter 41 of Genesis encourages uh, uh, them that in good years, put back, you know, put back 20% of what comes in. Because in lean years, you might need it. How can you do that? Okay, a few simple things. The quickest way to get a raise is to cut a bill. You can't always determine what comes in, but you can control what goes out. Be discerning. Realize that your choice today affects your tomorrow. One of the problems with a dollar, you know what a problem with a dollar is? Is that it only spends one time. Saying yes to spending that dollar here means you're saying no to spending it anywhere else. Contemplate the consequences of your actions. You might want a new car. You know what? But you may not can afford it. And you might not even know it. But I promise you that you can get to a place, if you will, you can get to a place where you can afford to bring your tithes to the house of the Lord. You can afford to begin to save 10%. You can afford to begin to give some offerings and afford to begin to save 20%. You can get to the place where you can live on six apples and you can live as good as any one of your neighbors. It's just management. Life is not better because you make more money. Don't believe that lie. Life is sweet when you manage what you have. And the stress and the frustration and the fear and the lack, you know, no longer threatens you. Does this make sense? Okay. I believe it is the will of God for every one of us to release the past and not let the hardships of the past determine our future. I believe it's the will of God that every one of us believes in increase, even in affliction. That principles of increase work whenever you are, wherever you are, whoever you are. I believe God wants to bless us even if the world is not being blessed. Even if a local economy is hurt, I believe God wants us 
to continue working hard and, 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 and living right and, and being you know, someone who has good business principles and takes advantage of opportunity even in the midst of affliction. I believe God wants us to make solid business decisions. Okay? Not stupid ones. Look down the road. Be wise. Contemplate your consequences and choose to do today what is best for your future. Not necessarily what's best for your today. Okay? Because saying yes to something that you want today, that you really, if you look down the road, you'll realize tomorrow, you're not, it's going to be in there with all those other purses. How many pair of shoes can you wear? I've gone to meddling now. How many guns can you own? You know, how many cars can you drive? The quickest way to get a raise is to cut a bill. Realize that spending a dollar means that you never get a chance to spend that dollar again. Okay. Be faithful to God. He watches over the harvest of the righteous okay. and learn to live on less because in reality, you never know when you might get less. Learn to live on less. Okay. <laughs> I know that's not the American dream theology, okay. but it's reality. The life of Joseph encourages us to release the past. Number two, to keep sowing even in hard times. And number three, to save for our future. If you leave here, you know, tonight with these three things and making a commitment that you're going to not let the past hinder your future. If you leave here tonight feeling as though that you're going to continue to increase. God will. Have faith now. God will increase you, even in affliction. If you leave here tonight, determined that you're going to find a way. You know, you're not going to make it up, you know, take that big step. You, you know, if you're in a place where you can take that big 20% step as a first step, okay, gosh, I got 20% extra. Do it. Put it in savings. But most likely you aren't. You're going to have to get there step by step. You know? Like Joseph, there's 14 years covered, you know, in this plenty and famine land. Step by step, little by little. It may take you a while, but please pay attention to what God is saying. And I believe he's saying he'll increase us. He'll watch over the harvest of the righteous. And I believe he's saying that we need to save for our future. Okay. Begin a plan. When you get a raise... Or you get extra money. Let me tell you what to do with extra money. If you get extra, you know what extra money? Extra money is money you didn't expect to get. Okay? Let me tell you what you do with it. Because mentally, when you get extra money, it's like free money. It's like money that I didn't work for. I mean, it didn't, I mean it's here. I didn't expect it to be here. So I can let it go out quickly. Any extra money you get, do yourself a favor. Make a decision. That unless it's something you're believing God for specifically for that, any extra money goes into your uh, 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 checking account or your savings account and stays there 30 days before you spend it. After 30 days, I promise you it'll be your money. You'll feel different about it after 30 days. Okay? Hello? You'll feel different about it after 30 days. You know, all right. We having fun yet? Now, if you need any personal encouragement or personal, you know, help with your finances, then, uh, you know, get some, okay? Get some. But I can't stress to you enough how important it is that you save for your future. Start a plan. Learn to live on a little less. Okay? Okay. Oh, okay. I preached better than you amen I did. I tell you, God gave me, you don't, you don't have to, <laughs> thank you. That was solicitous, I know. But you, uh, you uh, and, and, and it wasn't for that. I just wanted to sink in. I believe in you. God has a plan for your life. Okay. 
Lord, help us, sir, to release the past, Lord, to continue sowing even in times, Lord, of hardship and difficult times. Increase us, Lord. Even when no one else is increasing, Lord, I pray and I believe increase. Thank you, Lord. And God, help each one of us, Lord, to begin a plan of saving, Lord. Having a goal, Lord, if they don't have any other goal, why not 20%, Lord? Why not more? But God, help us to save, Lord, for our future. To be wise and discerning, like Joseph was who saved a whole nation and all of his family because he was wise and discerning. In Jesus' name we pray.